Um, and so tonight, uh, we're happy to have Steve here with us. As you know, uh, Steve was just sworn in as the 2023 president of the Encosi Chesapeake chapter. He has over 37 years of experience in applying systems engineering principles and methods in the defense and aerospace industries, cyber operations, homeland security, and healthcare technology. Uh, like I mentioned, he's the co-author of our door prize for tonight. He received his doctorate from GW University in 2021 and holds multiple degrees from Johns Hopkins. And so with that, I'll turn over the podium to uh, Steve. Great, thank you, Michael. I'm gonna share my screen and get my chat window all set. So uh, there we go. So welcome everybody to our first monthly lecture series. And uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, what's hot for 2023 in systems engineering. Uh, I do have to say, though, that uh, I realized as I was putting this together, I kept thinking to myself, well, is my list going to be the same as your list? And I realized, of course, that the answer is obviously no. So if I don't, uh, if I don't list or, or talk about something that you are interested and passionate about, first of all, my apologies. And second of all, please feel free to put in the chat window your ideas, your concepts, whether they relate to some of the topics I'm going to address tonight or new topics that uh, I'm not addressing tonight. And I'm sure there will be uh, several. So uh, I'm excited about that. I'm not offended in, in any way. All right. So before I get into some of the hot topics, first of all, shameless plug for the SE Vision 2035. Uh, obviously, Hot topics in systems engineering today are certainly going to be a major part of systems engineering. At least that is the theory in the future. And so if you want to see a longer range uh, vision of where systems engineering is going and what it, it possibly could be or potentially could be, then I do recommend the Vision 2035. And again, our March speaker is going to be talking on this very topic. And then secondly, shameless plug for the working groups. I know I just went over those, but uh, obviously you could argue that we have 51 hot topics in systems engineering for 2023, and there they are. So, uh, so I definitely encourage you to take a look there's a lot of good material, a lot of uh, good products that the working groups have been putting out over the past several years. So I didn't want to ignore the, the uh, set of working groups. They are, in fact, could certainly be considered hot topics for the next year. So with that as a backdrop, then uh, let's get into the hot topics. And the first question that needs to be answered is, all right, Steve, what do you mean by hot, right? What constitutes a hot topic. So I do have a different perspective based on my experience. I'm involved in both the commercial world, in the government world, and in the academic world. So one of the questions, or at least what I've been listening to um, over the past year and looking towards the future are, what are companies saying? And, and in particular, what are managers and executives talking about. And so one of the nice parts of working for NQC and being a member of the NQC community is we get to hear managers and executives, and we get to hear the questions they're asking. So I'm going to look at that approach, but I'm also going to be focusing in on what are the customers investing in? Where are they putting their money? What are the practitioners using, you and I? And then lastly, from the academic side, as well as the commercial and government side, what are the researchers researching? So I went off and, and did this, collected all my notes, did some research. And in, in fact, I came up with a, a significant list of topics. And of course, I had to consolidate down to try to put all this in 45 minutes. So once again, if I don't touch on your topic, it doesn't mean I don't think it is a hot topic for 2023. I just had to call my list for time's sake. So please, I, I value your opinion in this as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with the first question. 
in my topic. So I'll first ask, what are managers and executives asking? What are they talking about? What are some of the important aspects of these topics? So it is from a manager or a, a company enterprise level that we'll start out with, and then I'll dive into some of the details. Well, no, no list of trends and topics for the next year uh, would be complete without at least bringing up model-based systems engineering. This is an, an area that quite honestly, executives and managers are asking about. I know that because they have asked a number of the members of our chapter and in particular, some of the board members when we've talked to them. And so they're asking some very specific questions, but also as I've dug into this and practiced this, as well as did some research into this, I've also seen a number of issues, concerns, and success stories come out. So my first hot topic is really a topic that's been hot for quite a while, and that is model-based systems engineering. So in my rounds and in our rounds, as we talk with different companies and government organizations, and in particular, their leadership, I hear very common questions. And the first question is, what is it? Now, remember, this is from a management slash leadership perspective, not from necessarily from a practitioner's perspective. I could ask all of you, what is model-based systems engineering? And certainly most of you would have a pretty good idea and be able to at least describe what it is from your perspective, certainly. But from the executives, when we talk about it, I keep hearing the same questions. What is it? Because they're not sure what it is and what it means. And then how can I participate? This was a key question that came up again and again in my discussions. In other words, they want transparency. They are not sure how do I participate as a manager as opposed to a practitioner in model-based systems engineering. A, a common or, or a similar question is, do I have to learn the model? And so now the question becomes, well, wait a minute, do we have to train a whole host of leaders and executives and managers? And maybe the answer is yes, but quite honestly and realistically, they don't have a lot of time to do that. So regardless of what model or models you're using, how do we communicate to our leadership what this is, what are the products, and where we go in the future? Where are we and, and what are the next steps? Uh, the next, so that's something that we're going to have to address. The third question, and it's really related to the last question, is why is it so expensive? Or really what they're asking is what is the return on investment? If I take my organization and implement model-based systems engineering, what do I get? What's the value? And is the value greater than the cost? And so they're looking not so much at the licenses, although I put that, but honestly, what, twenty dollars or $30,000 a year for an, an enterprise license is not that much. But they are looking at training and the learning curve. So people, that's, of course, the the most expensive asset in any engineering effort. So what is the training? What is the learning curve? Um, what do I need to do? Does everyone in my workforce need to understand model-based systems engineering as well as learn the models? So those are definitely some questions. So I want to pull the thread. I'm actually going to spend the most time in the details here before I start moving on to the others because now I want to bring in some observations that I've made. And maybe perhaps you resonate with these or, or perhaps um, these just simply don't apply to you and that's okay. So again, I'm assuming um, because if nothing else, we in the chapter have had numerous talks on model-based systems engineering. And so we have the basic concept behind this, and that is the traditional systems engineering has largely been a document-based effort. And so model-based systems engineering, of course, becomes uh, the focus becomes the model. And so the transition of how we get from traditional to model-based is 
what companies and organizations are now working through. So just to kind of give you an idea, if I bring in the common systems engineering V here, my version, uh, you know, there, there are many different types of versions. Um, that's what I want to talk a, a little bit about in, in telling you my observations of where model-based systems engineering is and where it needs to go from what I've seen. First of all, when, when we say documents, we don't mean that it's literal documents, although yes, uh, some people like paper, but I, I'm talking about something like the Microsoft, Microsoft Office suite. So uh, if we are restricted or if we are relying on Word and PowerPoint and Excel and Visio, et cetera, that's document-based systems engineering. That's not model-based systems engineering. So just to, to kind of put everyone on the same page. So let me tell you an observation or share an observation I've had because I've, I've talked with a number of companies. And of course, every company, every government organization, every customer wants to say and does that they practice model-based systems engineering. What I would argue is that most organizations today practice systems engineering with a model. Furthermore, I would argue, again, from my experience and, and uh, working with and talking with different companies and practitioners especially, what most companies and organizations really are doing are systems architecting with a model where the focus is on the requirements and architecture, and really in, in particular, the architecture part. Most companies today use one or more of the suite of architecture tools we have available. I've included a, a couple of examples. The list is much longer, by the way, but these are some that I'm sure you've probably heard before. And so when companies employ these types of tools, which most of these tools only do what I would call architecture, they really struggle with detailed design. And a design engineer could very well argue if he or she looked at these tools and, and they may indeed say, these are not detailed design tools. These are system architecting tools. And so a lot of our organizations really are missing out on what model-based systems engineering is. Now, this is my term, not anyone else's systems engineering or architecting with a model, but I've seen this over and over again. So in many cases, this is where we are. There are exceptions, by the way, and I have met with companies that actually are much more mature than simply systems engineering with a model, where I've seen some companies uh, where they're at is they have a suite of models that do a subset of the different aspects of systems engineering. And so my little circles or ovals represent tools or models that are applied in that particular area. So I've seen some limited numbers, but some companies that will utilize a tool or suite of tools to capture stakeholder needs, to articulate requirements, either textually or graphically, that can do computer-aided design, that can do computer-aided manufacturing and assembly, can also tools that enable and assist in testing and integration, and then finally, verification and validation. Ideally, and really where, system, for where model based systems engineering comes in, is that these tools would be linked. Initially, perhaps manually, but ultimately, they would be linked so that data can transfer from one suite of tools to another. This is where we start to really get in to model-based systems engineering, where it might be a suite of tools that a company or organization uses, 
but surrounded by a framework or an environment by which data can pass from one to the other. So that at no time do we rely on documents or documentation, though you can produce it. Most of these tools, you can push a button and it'll produce a report or some form of documentation. But I see this as the general environment where a lot of companies are striving and it would represent a significant maturity level. Now, ideally, model-based systems engineering is this represented here, where in fact, the entire system development life cycle is performed within what some people call a digital ecosystem, where it's more than just a framework linking tools together. In fact, it's an entire ecosystem that all works together. So that, again, there's no dependence on documentation and the model truly becomes the authoritative source of data and information. So what I've seen in my experience, both in academia, but especially in government and industry, is that they're working, they're in the process. We as, an, as a discipline are in the process of maturing, which is great news. And so this will continue, I believe, in 2023. And we'll, start, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I believe it'll start to accelerate as we continue to, to grow. Of course, getting to something like this or the slide before is going to take commitment, obviously. It's going to take money, capital. It's going to take skills, training, knowledge, education as well. So there's an implicit set of requirements in order to achieve what we today call model-based systems engineering. And that's, that's going to be partly a sales job from us, the practitioners, to those decision makers that have the authority and the capital to implement something like this. And I'm not saying we go immediately to this situation, but I do see movement in this area. And in fact, this is nothing new. This isn't, uh, th this isn't just Steve's work, obviously. Um, there are a lot of articles and papers and industry uh, presentations that we've seen and we continue to drive towards the ideal in, uh, in model-based systems engineering. All right, so that's number one. I still believe MBSE is a hot topic. I actually believe it will be a hot topic over the next decade because we have a ways to go and we're, we are doing that, which is good news. Tools, methods, approaches are maturing and we're finding out what works and what doesn't, all right? Okay, that's number one. I wish I could stay and spend more time on it. I actually had a lot more to say about this, but, um, but I'm not gonna go into it. So in the interest of time, I wanna go to my second hot topic. Again, this is an area that I've talked to organizations and especially leadership, managers. So agile systems engineering. Again, first question that I hear from a lot of these leaders, thought leaders, decision makers, is what is it? They know basically the concept of agile, right? Agile has been around for quite a while and that's good news. So when managers hear about agile, and they're encouraged by it, they wanna know how do we implement something like this? And then they have some other questions. Number one, how do I participate? So if agile systems engineering is collaborative and participative and involves stakeholders working side by side with practitioners and developers and engineers, et cetera, then how does a manager get in here? Do we still have reviews? How, does, how can I know what the status of a project is? In other words, how do I participate? How do I have transparency into the project, into the development? 
And then how is it different from traditional model-based and is it cheaper? Again, what's the return on investment? So a lot of questions are being raised. Now, let me shift to my observations, just again, based on talking with folks. So first and foremost, and of course, if you are, um, are you, if you are involved in agile systems engineering, this will resonate. I'm preaching to the choir, I realize. So agile does not mean process independent. It doesn't mean that there is no process or that it's ad hoc. Of course, agile means we tailor the process. We also use some different methods, but there is a cost. It's collaborative, it's participative. Stakeholders have to invest more time to help make agile systems engineering work. And when it's applied correctly, it can in fact achieve a number of goals, including one of the primary goals, and that is to reduce the time for system development, among others. But here's the key requirement that I've seen in talking with organizations as well as talking with uh, practitioners who use agile methods, and that is transparency, communication, and a defined process. In other words, and I'm, I admit I'm taking a manager's leadership perspective here. What do organizations want to ensure? What do managers and, and decision makers want to ensure? They want to know how can they make agile systems engineering transparent, especially to them, to decision makers in their organization, to stakeholders that may not have the time to participate fully in, um, in coordination with transparency, then communication is also part of that equation. And what I've seen and what I've heard from managers and decision makers is they don't wanna to be told that agile is a process-free method. In fact, they understand process. It's one of the reasons why they got to be a manager or a leader or a decision maker to begin with. So they wanna know what is the process. And in fact, we have processes for uh, Agile. I have one example. This is the IBM Harmony uh, process or method. Um, not that I'm endorsing any one method over the other. It's just a, an example to show. And so leadership and, and managers, they need to understand that. But the key really is transparency and communication. So it's something that we as systems engineers who are practicing agile methods need to be cognizant of. If we are going to make agile systems engineering work, if we're gonna sell it to our decision makers, our in investment uh, decision makers, then we need to also realize this has got to be transparent and we've got to understand how best to communicate where we are and what we're doing. All right. So that's my number two, agile systems engineering. Those two are ones that I've heard quite a bit, especially from organizational leadership. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to start shifting a little bit more to my academic and my practitioner side. I'm still going to have a, a, a perspective of managers and decision makers. But now what I've been able to do is draw in some of the topics or, or pull out some of the topics that um, academia is talking about as well as practitioners. So the third hot topic in my view has, is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the key point here is what does it mean? So what does AI and ML mean for systems engineering? And where is it applied? So this is an interesting point because AI and ML are areas that are becoming increasing, increasingly a part of our systems. Our complex systems 
are incorporating AI and ML. But there's another aspect as well, and that is to ask, how will AI and ML impact systems engineering? In other words, in the development life cycle. So that's why I have my little V. I brought that back to indicate some of the areas and some of the stages where AI and ML certainly holds promise. Not that the other areas it, it doesn't. I don't mean that, but there's a particular focus on architecture and design as well as integration testing and verification. So this is important for us as systems engineering practitioners to understand because this is coming if it hasn't already appeared in your workplace. And so again, from the organizational perspective, what is it, right? We always have that question, but more importantly, what I hear, and this is not, not just limited to executives and managers, but uh, also practitioners, how will AI and ML change systems engineering? Or will it? Or is it just something that, oh, it's another feature, another attribute of our system that we need to design in? And then as I mentioned, there are two parts to the question. And that is, how can AI and machine learning impact or improve system development? And then how can it be incorporated appropriately, correctly into our systems that we deploy? So there's two aspects of that particular area. By the way, I use the V for illustration purposes. Obviously, I understand that nonlinear processes um, are in fact where we are today. So uh, please don't get hung up on the V, it's for illustration only. All right, so I've started to, to peel back artificial intelligence. Now I have to admit my age makes me biased. So I came out of college in 1985 and guess what? In engineering, one of the hottest topics in 1985 was artificial intelligence. There were new programs spouting up in colleges. We were gonna train these new generation of engineers to understand and incorporate artificial intelligence. And there were a lot of big promises made. Those of you that are close to my age, you might well remember those times. AI was going to revolutionize the world and it didn't at least not in the time frame they were talking about. They were talking about advanced robotics in the home by 2000, didn't happen. Now, a lot of great things did happen even with household systems and appliances, but it, it, it wasn't based on AI. I've seen a resurgence. So in my work, both again in academia as well as in industry, I've seen a resurgence of AI and machine learning. And I'm starting now to believe the hype. Now, please, if you think that's wrong, let me know. I'll, I will be glad to hear your opinion. And I wouldn't be shocked if some of you said, I've heard all this before, because I've heard all this before. All right. And yeah, 20 years from now, we might all be in the same place. Like, wow, back in 2023, man, AI was all the rage and it didn't happen. So yeah, there's a, a, a chance, a risk of that happening. But I'm starting to believe, maybe I'm listening to too many younger people and they're telling me AI is coming if it's not already here. And so all of this, including robotics, for example, um, including in the healthcare field, there are really what could be called revolutions happening. So that's why I'm tending now to be much more optimistic about AI and what it can offer. So what does that mean for systems engineering? Well, systems engineering needs to evolve with it. Now, I'm not an AI guy. I am not an expert. 
In fact, um, I recently bought the book that I'm showing from Springer, not that it is the book on artificial intelligence and systems engineering. I don't know. I haven't read any other books on AI, so I have a sample size of one. But I am starting to learn. And what I am seeing is that in systems engineering, and in particular, in our architectures and in our designs, a lot of the tools that we have or the models that we have are static, meaning that when we develop an architecture and ultimately translate that into a detailed design, the system as we've designed it is a static system. So AI and machine learning is going to mean that we need to enable that aspect into our systems development. The design needs to incorporate AI and ML. So that means the system is not gonna be as static as it used to be. So I'm used to complexity because I've seen the, the explosion in complexity in the 30 years I've been doing this work. But what I haven't seen nearly as explosive is the ability to design into our systems change, dynamic. If we're going to learning systems, learning being an adjective, then that needs to be designed in. And so we'll need to understand what the implications are. And I don't have the answers. Like I said, I've read one book. I like the book, by the way. Um, I don't know uh, any of you who know Tom McDermott. He is up at Stevens Institute of Technology. I've read some of his things. I, I like his approach. All right. So I, I have a lot of respect for the editors here, but I have a, a sample size of one right now. So I do encourage all of you that are in artificial intelligence and machine learning, help the rest of us out by A, understanding what is it? Now, it's not just managers that are asking the, this question, but I'm asking the question. And then secondly, what do I need to do as a systems engineering professional to ensure that I can lead a project, a development effort for a learning or AI-based system? That's important to me. OK, um, and then the, the corollary question is, what do we need to change? Do our methods work? Do our tools and frameworks and modeling languages work? I've started to see, at least in the literature, some discussion of AI modeling language or languages. I'm not familiar with those. I'm familiar with the, the common modeling languages that we use, SysML, the UAF modeling language, Unified Architecture Framework modeling language. I'm used to those, all right? But I'm not used to AI. So help us out. What's different? And what do we need to know as systems engineers? I believe that's a, going to be a major thrust in the coming year and beyond, all right? Um, the other, there are some other areas too, which I'm not yet clear on how is this all work together? How does, how is this all intertwined? So there are some enablers or corollaries to artificial intelligence, internet of things, cloud data and computing, which allows systems to gather data in volumes never before seen. And where are we with interoperability as well? So if we're going to take AI, it's not going to be just a single system approach because systems are going to have to work with each other. And how can AI and machine learning apply, be applied across systems to a family of system or a system of systems? All right, so important questions. And I'm really excited about this area. As a, uh, by the way, just a, as an aside, in all three universities that I teach, 
AI always comes up. And I teach systems engineering courses at these three universities. The students that I have are now heavily vested and immensely interested in AI. And so th this has caused me to start trying to learn a little bit because they're asking me questions I can't answer. So as an instructor, that's uh, not exactly a place that I want to be, but I also learn more from them from AI, in AI and ML than they do for me. So I'd like to learn. All right, cool. Uh, let me go to my number four. And, and this is similar to the last one, but I put it as a separate thrust area or to hot topic, and that is augmented reality. Now, I again, I will admit that I'm skeptical, just like AI 30 years ago, um, AR, augmented reality, I'm not sure where we'll be in five years. I'm not sure where we'll be in 10 years. So I'm, I'm putting in a little bit of optimism here. Of course, people are asking, number one, what is it? And number two, what can we really do with it? And when I start talking to both practitioners and decision makers and managers, if they are my age, roughly, or they're younger, but they're Trekkies, some of the first questions that are out of their mouth says, okay, when are we going to see the Star Trek holodeck concept? If you're not familiar with that, please Google it. You'll, you'll get a, a good chuckle. But for those of us who remember the old series, the original series, and as well as the new, uh, the holodeck concept, augmented reality, in, in now and that was in an extreme way. But let me go here. So I, I pulled down some sources, and I just thought I'd show you some of the pictures. So of those four pictures, a rhetorical question, which one of those pictures are real? And the answer, of course, is none. None. We do great in graphic artist terms. So the, then the natural question is, well, when is this going to be real? On the left-hand side of my slide. All right, that's cool. When do I get to see that? Now, in some areas, there is reality that is similar to some of these pictures. But honestly, when I do some research, when I look in augmented reality, the most things I see are these kind of pictures. In other words, what could be done in the future. So I believe that where we are now is a transition period of going from these fancy pictures and Hollywood, all right, Industrial Lights, uh, Light and Magic does a wonderful job with picturing augmented reality in the movies. But when will it be a reality in the engineering world? So I, I know for a fact, because my own company does some of this, but nothing like what these pictures show. So I know that, you know, some cases they're, they're doing that. When, when does it become a reality and when is it widespread? So I, I think in my opinion, we're in a transition point from taking the expectations that we all have from the movies and then taking that and re-correcting, uh, rather, shifting our focus to what can be done and what is the potential and then how do we get there? How do we get there? And then where does it apply? So let me go back here. Where does it apply? Well, so far, when you do research, and by the way, I did some research for what trends are in systems engineering, and I looked at a whole uh, wealth of, of websites, which some are, you know, they range from serious to, well, less than serious. But the, the point in this case is, hey, augmented reality could revolutionize systems engineering, and in particular, model-based systems engineering. So cool, I'm all in. When do I get to see it? All right. And so that's the big question. That's why I say we're at a transition period. We now need to go from 
the movies, yeah, you can do a lot with graphics to reality. And so we'll see where we go. Well, when we get there, what does it change? Well, honestly, it does revolutionize what we used to call physical prototypes and virtual prototypes. If augmented reality can become part of our world, our discipline, then the lines between virtual prototype and physical prototype begin to blur significantly. Then we bring in model-based systems engineering principles and some of the, the uh, discussions that you've had in the chat, I have been keeping an eye on the chat, and digital model-based systems engineering, digital systems engineering, et cetera. I think there's a lot of promise here, especially if we can incorporate into augmented reality performance and human interaction or intervention. What I've seen today, and your experience is different than mine, so you might see a, a, a greater maturity. What I've seen in my experience with augmented reality is much more visualization. I can take a three-dimensional object, I can put on a set of artificial, or excuse me, uh, augmented reality goggles, and I can even put on gloves and I can turn systems using three degrees of motion but it's only visualization. I haven't yet experienced where I can take my three-dimensional system or object and go in and grab a component and pull it out and put another component in. I think in the research field, that capability or those kinds of capabilities are there. So it's just a question of when will that come into the engineering world. And in some areas it has, I realize, but it's not mainstream yet. So I do think there's a lot of promise here, but I don't want to see augmented reality become what artificial intelligence was 30 years ago, where 20, 25 years from today, when I'm in an assisted living facility, I open up my computer and I see an article that says, what happened to augmented reality? I don't wanna see that. So I'm excited, but I'm also an optimist. So that's number four. I'm gonna to need to wrap things up. So number five, I'll go through some of these quickly. Number five is digital engineering. We, by the way, we have an advocate of digital engineering uh, with us. He is part of the Working group, NQC working group on digital uh, engineering and uh, information interactions. So please look up the working group, but digital engineering, what is it? So my first exposure to digital engineering was this, Department of Defense, United States, digital engineering strategy. I had never heard of the term. I kind of understood it just from the words they used. So what is it? Well. I was able to get a definition of many for what it is. I even started to peel the onion back on what is digital engineering. Well, there's some important concepts that are part of this digital thread, sometimes used as a synonym for digital engineering, digital twin. I heard that a lot from a number of folks where I work that are in digital engineering and they are practitioners. Digital transformation was another area. And then I asked myself, and maybe you have too, what's the difference between digital engineering and model-based systems engineering? Because honestly, when I read the DOD strategy and I started to peel back the onion and do some research, and talk with folks, my initial reaction was, this is just another word for digital, or digital engineering is another word for model-based systems engineering. All right, I am not of that opinion. I do think there are some differences. So here's one source that I read that I thought was pretty good. Again, this uh, comes from 
the uh, Stevens Institute, their Systems Engineering Research Center, by the way, again, not, not an endorsement, even though I've, I've drawn two examples from them, but some uh, two figures which helped me a great deal understand some things, and especially where does model-based systems engineering fit? So at least the way it's been explained to me, and it makes sense, digital engineering is broader than model-based systems engineering, but it incorporates model-based systems engineering. I'm starting to believe. Again, in 2018, when this first came out, I was very skeptical and I didn't understand this. I just thought, well, DOD had to create their own term for what we all do anyway, or what we're all striving to do, but it's more than that. So I'm starting to believe. And in fact, I work with a number of folks in my, my organization, and by the way, with members of the uh, Chesapeake chapter, who they've done a great job educating me on what digital engineering is. I believe that again, this is in a transition point. I see the scales tipping where digital engineering is going to start being mainstream if it's not already. Yes, it started in DOD, started in the US government, but I'm starting to see this come up in the commercial world as well. And even some preliminary work in the academic world. So uh, it's encouraging, but I'm finally no longer, and I apologize to all of you digital engineering advocates out there. I finally am like, okay, I'm not skeptical anymore. I, I won't just laugh when the name comes up. All right, it's important. I wish I could talk more about this, and I'm sure some of you uh, would love to talk about this with me and, and the rest of the chapter, but I wanna go on to my last two hot topics. Security, I can't, I can't have a hot topic list without bringing in security. It is still that important, even though it's been around for quite a while. Some of the questions that I have is, what do we do with system security? Is it a specialty engineering area? Or is it a field that is broader than that? I will say I did find the uh, this one source from NIST, so a fairly authoritative source that says, and you can see the first bullet in, in the little figure here, uh, system security engineering is a specialty engineering discipline of systems engineering. Okay, cool, very cool. So I'm willing to understand that. Now the question is, what is different? What do we need to do as systems engineers to ensure that we have adequately engineered security and especially cybersecurity in our system? So what needs to change? Or is it something that we need to simply include a system security engineering person on our team and let them help us? I think it's more than that. I think that it, we, we need to treat it a little more than just simply, oh, it's, it's another specialty, just, just like our list of 30 specialty engineers that we have access to, if not on our team. So that's something that I think uh, is going to be with us in this year and in the future, all right? And then my last, my last hot topic, and uh, I am biased, again, I have to admit it, because this was the topic of my dissertation. So I have a passion for system of systems engineering. So it may or may not be on your list of hot topics in, in 2023, but I'll admit it is mine. So what is the issue and where do we need to go? The issue that I have personally, again, I have my own biases. I am hearing more and more from people, whether they be managers, leaders, decision makers, or practitioners, that everything is a system of systems now. I see new projects to develop a new system that I would simply um, categorize as a, a systems engineering effort, a, a complex system, yes, but a single system. And undoubtedly, 
the program manager will come in and at our kickoff meeting, first thing or some of the first words out of his mouth are, we're really designing a system of systems. Now I argue, well, not out loud, but at least in my own mind, I'm like, no, this is not a system of systems. This is a good complex system that requires good systems engineering. So what's the difference? Well, part of the research I am doing is asking the question, are our methods, our frameworks and our tools, do they enable us to engineer in the inherent dynamic behavior of a system of systems. And I'm coming up with more no's than yeses. So some of the key concepts that we need to bring in and really emphasize if, if we wanna be true system of systems engineers are the fact that these entities will exhibit dynamic and emergent behavior they will consist of independent constituent systems, which means they were developed independently and they have their own set of objectives and that needs to be taken into account. They have a dynamic constituent system relationship. So relationships among constituent systems change and they're constantly changing. And so a focus needs to be on information and decisions because that's the area that is one of the weakest points of system of systems, whether it be infrastructure like our power grid or our transportation network or our communications networks, or simply large system of system entities. So that's an area that I'm very interested in. So I, I admit that may not be on your list, uh, but it is on mine. To wrap things up, because I do see we're at the hour, at the top of the hour, I purposefully did not get into domains. I would refer you to the Systems Engineering Vision 2035. I copied the figure out. They talk about six domains in particular that will be very critical in the next 15, 20 years. All right. And so um, if you did not see your domain, um, this might include your particular domain that you're interested in. So I purposely pull back. And then I've got a couple of honorable mentions. Big data, I could not, um, I couldn't have a list without at least mentioning big data. What does it mean? What does it mean to systems engineers and, and the discipline? And then requirements analysis which interestingly enough, I heard some, uh, cons uh, some debate going on before we got started tonight. And I'm really pleased to hear people talking about it. It's funny, everyone that I talk to agrees textual based requirements uh, just are, are not doing it for the systems engineering world. And yet, mainly by our customers' requests, we, we are very heavily focused on textual requirements, all right? But there is a number of research areas looking at, is there a different way to represent and articulate system requirements? So I, I'm fascinated by that issue. All right, well, unfortunately, I'm out of time. Uh, as you probably can tell, I could literally talk with you for hours I'd love to hear your opinion. I've been keeping an eye on the uh, the comments. Um, at this point, I realize it is getting late, but um, let's see. Uh, uh, let me just look at some questions. Um, okay, I've got questions. I think that's um, that might be from Michael. I believe it's a it's an Incasy Chesapeake chapter. I think Michael, that was you. Um, question to ask: Applying machine learning, what is the training data set? Uh, I love that question. I don't have a good answer for that, but I think that that is something that is, is extremely important. And that's what a lot of managers are asking as well. Do we as systems engineers need to learn AI and ML do, to be able to engineer AI systems? So uh, excellent question. All right, and I like your, your points uh, about uh, neural networks and, and some of the other training. Uh, methods and, and data. Second question you asked is when managers ask about return on investment, are they asking 
what is the return of investment of MBSE versus no or MBSE versus traditional? The latter. When I've been asked those questions, when I discuss with uh, some of the managers that I encounter, the, it's the latter question. Most companies today in our discipline use systems engineering. In fact, that's been a success story. Over the last 20 years, 20 years ago, I would have stood up here and said, how do we get our leadership to invest and become passionate about systems engineering? I don't think that's anywhere near the issue that it was 20 years ago. I think it's a success story. NQC has been a big part of that, but in large, it's been a bottom-up approach. It's not something that was a fad that started in a country and it spread across the globe. This is something that practitioners really made happen, including gathering together and organizing in different communities, one of which is Incosy. So uh, yes, uh, Michael, if this is uh, you, it's the latter. I don't hear anybody, any of the managers and executives and leaders I talk to questioning systems engineering. I don't see one. Now, maybe they've been beaten down into submission. I don't know. I'll be optimistic and say they're believers now. And, and fortunately, the managers of today were the practitioners 20 years ago. So I think that's a big part. We've outlasted the, uh, the original set of managers and leaders. They've retired. And so now practitioners have stepped up. So, Michael, does that uh, answer your question? Great. Great. All right, cool. Um, let's see, Bruce asks, when locking down the functionality so it can be turned on remotely, you pay an extra charge, even though you're already paid for, for the hardware. I, I agree with that. And that's something that we uh, we need to address. Um, and that's that, I don't know when in the presentation, uh, Bruce, you had that question, but but that question actually applies in a more general term to a lot of these methods. And that, especially when dealing with any kind of dynamic processes where the process itself changes within a system, whether it's due to machine learning or gathering data or using data analytics to learn or system of systems where relationships and data sharing are dynamic. It, regardless, um, that is something that that's extremely uh, well asked. And yeah, we need to be able to develop a method are we paying too high a price by trying to engineer in all possibilities? I don't think that's the answer. I think we're, we're gonna need to engineer in the dynamic nature of our new systems, our AI-based systems, our complex systems and system of systems to incorporate that dynamic. And that's one of the areas that I, that I see, we might not have the best methods and tools yet or modeling languages and architecture frameworks yet to handle that dynamic aspect of modern systems. So we'll see, but I definitely think it's something we need to be cognizant of and, and explore as we go forward. All right, uh, I don't, I see a lot of comments. By the way, thank you everybody. I, I really appreciate you uh, bringing all this in. Um, oh, Jeff. So, Jeff, you, you're the last question. Uh, we need to wrap it up. How do system engineering models address non-deterministic configurations produced by AI? In my experience, they don't. Okay. They don't. However, and Bruce, you this, I'm so glad you brought that in. So, there are other disciplines that do this, that have to anticipate the dynamic um, uh, configurations that a system goes through. So can we pull in our, some knowledge and experience from other domains and other disciplines to help learn? But to answer your question, Jeff, I don't believe our current suite does a good job at handling non-determinate or uh, well, even stochastic, but, but changing dynamic configurations within the system itself. That's where we need to really explore. How do we do that? Our models and our, our frameworks are static. And I don't mean that in a negative way. 
they don't handle, all right, what happens if the functionality or the configuration will change? What happens if the system itself will evolve? How do we engineer that in and, and what, what impact is that gonna be on systems engineering? So excellent. Um, oh, Joseph, uh, doesn't system of systems have a lot in common with operations research? Yes, it, it does. Um, and I think we, we can learn a lot of lessons from the OR uh, discipline as well. The, uh, the main issues though that I have, and, and I appreciate the OR part because I can handle stochastic processes. What I can't handle, what I don't see the tools doing a good job and the methods and the frameworks doing a good job is, what if the entire configuration of my system of systems changes from one moment to the next? How do I do that? I can put a drawing. Uh, uh, Michael, it was uh, might have been you that talked about functional flow block diagrams, right, earlier. Okay, I can draw a functional flow block diagram of a system or even, even a collection of systems. But what if, so that's a process, that's the, the activities model or an activities model. What if the sequence changes? Because that's what happens in system of systems. My functional flow block diagram changes from time period to time period. So how do I handle that? If I'm going to go into a tool, pick your favorite, Basically, I develop a single functional flow block diagram for my system or my collection of systems. What do I do now? Do I try to think of all possible process configurations and I put them all in my architecture? And then I have to do some sort of state machine transition logic. I, oh, state machine. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. So I can do that but it's unwieldy and it's prone to mistakes. And plus I'm expending a lot of effort to try to capture all the different possible states that my system of systems could be in. So I'd love to find a method and a framework that supports it where I could develop an engineer or design a dynamic process model, meaning the process itself is Will, will change is dynamic. So that's what I mean. Um, and in fact, I, I, I have looked in ops research. That's actually um, part of my undergrad degree was in OR. It takes me so far. So it does help, it helps a great deal. And your point about state machines, agree. It, that takes me so far and it does help, but I'd really like to go the next step. And I don't have an answer for that yet. But that's what I, I'm trying to look into. All right. So, of course, as systems engineers, yes, absolutely. Uh, as systems engineers, we're always exploring. We're always trying to take the, the next step. And that's a good thing. We're just naturally inquisitive. All right. Uh, thank you all. I'm, I'm going to have to end it there. But I do appreciate all the comments. I think the discussion has been fantastic. And thank you all for, um, for sticking around. I know I've gone past our time period, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Would love to talk about this uh, more. So please engage with me. Uh, I'm going to be around for a long time. All right. Not tonight, but I'm going to be around uh, for the next several years. Would love to talk to you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's see, uh, Michael, I'm going to...